Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Leo and Anastasia married three years ago. It's important to say that he would have never married her if this girl had not become the sole owner of her own business after the sudden death of her father. A stroke instantly took the life of a man who seemed young and robust to everyone around him. Anastasia, on the other hand, was his favorite and the only child in the family. After her mother's death, the girl became a ray of light for businessman Gerardo Gill. After the death of his first wife, Anastasia's mother, he preferred noncommittal encounters with young girls. Therefore, naturally, Anastasia became the sole heir to the entire fortune. It was beyond doubt that Anastasia didn't need money. That's why Leo, a charming but not too young libertine accustomed to living off women, took notice of her. If Anastasia listened to the beautiful promises of a professional playboy and believed them unconditionally, Leo, as usual, intended to live with the lady until a more advantageous option came along. It turned out that the most advantageous option, the jackpot of his life, was Anastasia. The colossal inheritance after Gerardo's death passed entirely into the hands of the girl. And Leo knew very well how to use money. The girl fell deeply in love. He thought he could easily manipulate her and dispose of all the means and assets at his discretion. After Anastasia's father's death, Leo's plans for the girl took a 180-degree turn. He mentally thanked all the saints that he hadn't parted with Anastasia and hadn't done something that would have blocked his way back. But everything worked out perfectly. The girl was truly devastated. Her father was her support and the most important person in her life. It became another gift for Leo, who could turn any situation to his advantage. He instantly surrounded the girl with care and attention, changed for the better, as it seemed to the unfortunate orphan, and at a crucial moment revealed his true face. The young and naive girl really didn't understand that the most terrifying moment in her life, on the contrary, prompted him to hide his true self even deeper. At least until the wedding, he didn't show it and behaved exceptionally well until there was no way back. The proposal of marriage followed almost immediately after the funeral, but of course, naturally, there was a period to mourn for her father. Leo was good at lying, twisting, and pretending, becoming whoever he needed to be and doing what was expected of him. He usually didn't make much effort with his wealthy girlfriends, thinking that there would be another one, and there was no need to bother or break a sweat. Even here, he was lazy and didn't want to exert extra effort, living by the motto, and so it goes. However, the stakes were high here, and the effort was not in vain, and the cunning man clearly understood that. He absolutely didn't and couldn't foresee that the first problem would come out of nowhere. Gerardo had a best friend, who was also the deputy chief of the company and Anastasia's godfather. He immediately understood that he couldn't dissuade the girl from marriage. The young and naive lady fell in love like a kitten, plus the pain of losing her father required compensation. But as a smart and insightful person, he insisted categorically on the young couple signing a prenuptial agreement before entering into marriage. Justino Ferrer, knowing his goddaughter much longer than the newlywed groom, easily managed to sway her to his side. Leo, if it's necessary for business, can't you just do it? The girl gently insisted, echoing what Justino had said to her. It humiliates me. Do you think I need money from you? The man was furious. Such a turn of events was completely against his plans. Darling, it's a simple formality. It's only in the case of a divorce. The Godfather really wants us to sign a prenuptial agreement. He has always been like a second father to me. And now... Leo wasn't the only one capable of manipulating in this relationship. The girl could do it too. Yes, she never had to worry about necessities, and perhaps it played a role and made her somewhat naive in financial matters, but otherwise, she wasn't a fool. If she set a goal, she would achieve it, no matter what. With such framing of the issue and such arguments, Leo had no choice but to do what she asked him to do. He had to agree to all of Justino's conditions. The wording in the prenuptial agreement was standard, but completely cut down on Leo's rights. It was clear even before that the business and all the other assets inherited from her father couldn't become joint property of the spouses. Accordingly, in the case of a divorce, 
this part would remain with Anastasia and wouldn't be a subject of dispute. But Leo naively assumed that he could turn to dividends, buy new property and assets, and so on. And, of course, he wanted to have legal rights to do so in the event of a divorce. The contract, drafted by a high-class lawyer, cut off this possibility for Leo. But he reasoned that this marriage was still extremely advantageous for him. He would be able to rummage through his wife's pockets without control and, in the end, accumulate capital for the future. He would slowly take money from the joint budget and transfer it to his name as the prenuptial agreement balanced the rights and interests. Bank accounts opened in the spouse's name also didn't count as jointly acquired property. And here, Leo didn't hit the jackpot. Justino was exceptionally loyal, honest, and responsible. He controlled Anastasia's financial flows, not only in business, but also in her personal finances. Leo was left with very modest sums for his personal expenses. Sometimes, the amounts were even less than what he was accustomed to in the pre-marriage days. But here, Leo decided not to despair and see how the situation would unfold in the future and in what favor the score would be at the end of the game. It turned out that patience was indeed a virtue that paid off. From the first day of marriage, Anastasia was desperately trying to get pregnant. She wanted to become a mother. But each new cycle brought bitterness and disappointment. Initially, she attributed it all to nerves and stress and the fast pace of life she was forced into. Taking over the business and learning on the fly naturally took a toll. Over a year of unsuccessful attempts forced the girl to finally consult specialists, undergo a full medical examination, and find the cause of the failures. It turned out that everything Anastasia had attributed to the insane lifestyle were symptoms and warning signs. Her body was alarming her that she had a problem, but she ignored it. In the end, the doctors delivered a bleak diagnosis. She had been diagnosed with cancer. She had undergone two years of treatment and suffering in her home country and then abroad, but it all yielded either no results or minimal successes, and a relapse to the previous state happened. And sometimes, it even got worse. For nearly two years, Anastasia had been being treated while Leo nominally had been playing the role of a loving spouse. His vested interest was simply that Anastasia wouldn't survive. Apparently, he couldn't hide it well enough. Neither she nor he openly spoke about it, but Anastasia knew about his countless affairs with other women. There were no secrets or revelations for her. Leo, on the other hand, seemed to think he was still very adept at deception and manipulation. He excelled at playing the role of husband to a dying wife, and no one knew about his affairs. He believed his lucky star had found him again, that he just had to endure a little longer, and a golden key would be in his pocket. Literally golden. However, everyone discussed Leo's behavior, starting from nurses and nannies in the hospitals where Anastasia stayed to Justino. He tried to open her eyes and showed her photos of Leo with other women. What are you waiting for? Get a divorce. Can't you see what he's doing? The man was simply outraged by his helpless fury. He couldn't understand this desperate desire of the woman to maintain the marriage when she was about to die. This topic was horrifying for him. He didn't want to further traumatize his beloved goddaughter. It was very painful for everyone, but when he realized that Anastasia knew everything about her husband's behavior, he stopped holding back. He was perplexed, listening to the girl's calm and steady voice in response. He also feared addressing one crucial legal nuance out loud. Anastasia had no will. Her sole first order heir was her husband. This scoundrel would inherit everything. There was no denying that Justino's efforts were also a pity. So much work turned to dust. He understood that this husband would squander the entire fortune within a few years. Justino couldn't find peace with this injustice, but he couldn't go against his conscience and openly talk to his goddaughter. Everyone knew that this conversation wouldn't be a precautionary measure at this point. It was no secret that there was no chance Anastasia was dying, and it would happen very soon. The countdown was in weeks. Leo was already rubbing his greedy hands, his eyes gleaming with anticipation of getting rid of his gloomy and sick wife and acquiring substantial capital. He thought everything would turn out in his favor. Justino prayed that he wouldn't have to bring up the topic of writing the wool himself. 
Fortunately, it wasn't necessary. Anastasia herself initiated the conversation. And what shocked the man was from his goddaughter's story, he didn't expect such well-thought-out steps, such cunning, and such cold calculation. Truly, revenge is a dish best served cold. Anastasia had internalized this maxim and brought it to life. What she came up with required a lot of effort and time from her. But, as she ended her journey on this earth, she fulfilled all her dreams and hopes. This conversation between the goddaughter and her second father was kept secret from all outsiders. Naturally, the traitor deceiver Leo was not part of this circle. He found out everything last, when it was already impossible to change anything. Unfortunately, a miracle did not happen, although up until the last moment, Anastasia's close ones were hoping for it. Everyone except her husband, though it was doubtful whether he could be called a close person. Anastasia passed away. The funeral and memorial service had already been arranged and meticulously planned by the deceased herself. She calmly and coolly made plans, dictated her final wishes, and expressed her will. The woman was calm and resolute. The day after the farewell ceremony, the notary called the people that Anastasia mentioned in her will and asked them to come for its reading. It turned out that Anastasia had written a will and kept it confidential. No one knew its contents, not even the notary. And for everyone, its contents would be a surprise. Only a note for the notary was opened, indicating the list of individuals who should have been present at the reading and on which day after her death to announce the deceased's will. This call shocked Leo. He was convinced that his wife had not prepared any official document in case of her death and that the husband would become her sole heir, as commonly provided by law in such cases. Still hoping for the best, he went to the appointed meeting with his new lover, the beauty Petra. He thought it would be a very effective show of confidence. It would spit in the faces of everyone present and his late wife, regardless of the will's text. He couldn't afford to leave there humiliated and disgraced, especially since he had nothing to lose. If Anastasia did leave him her property, the fact of having a mistress and the husband's immoral behavior wouldn't change anything. He thought he was cunning and wise, had considered all the possibilities, and covered his bases. It turned out that the deceased wife was wiser. Leo arrived at the meeting with Petra. It was a closed room where several people had already gathered. Seeing Justino, he wasn't surprised. But what shocked him was when he saw the family friend, that is, more of Anastasia's friend, her childhood friend Alejandro. The horror was that he didn't come alone. He came with a stroller containing a very young child, judging by the clothes, a boy. Leo had not heard of Alejandro getting married or the birth of a child. Leo, of course, didn't qualify for any advanced degrees, but he wasn't a complete fool either. His heart skipped a beat, and he understood that the situation was about to get worse. Everything here wasn't accidental, and he had been outsmarted. Nevertheless, he still needed to save face since he had already come. Curiosity was also nagging at him. He really wanted to know what Anastasia had come up with. Although it was already clear that it was something extremely humiliating for him. The situation escalated. Suddenly, it was revealed that there was a will, its secret announcement, and a little child in the room. For about 20 minutes, everyone present was sitting silently in different corners of the room. No one approached. The outcome was initiated by Anastasia's will, Justino, her godfather, and Anastasia's childhood friend Alejandro Dies, who arrived at such an event in strange company with a baby in a stroller. The boy was looking around with curiosity and seemed happy to be there. He was the only one who seemed satisfied with the company. Also, there were Leo and Petra in the room. Of course, Petra did not call Anastasia, and the notary was present strictly at Leo's initiative. He suspected that they would ask his girlfriend to leave to ensure the complete confidentiality of the procedure. But the old notary, who arrived on time to the minute, did not say a word about the presence of outsiders in the room who should leave. As Leo later surmised, it was done deliberately to humiliate him even more. The notary seemed to intentionally drag out the introductory part, explaining why they had gathered and how he, with great honor, was announcing the last will of the deceased. 
At this moment, Leo understood from the malicious grin that never left Justino's face and the floor-staring gaze of Alejandro that the contents of the wool were a secret only to him. The old man read the introductory part and preamble of the document long and torturously. But when he finally got to the most important part, he started with the obvious and mundane again. Anastasia had written the will in hopes of engaging the audience and eliciting their reactions, so there was nothing surprising or unexpected about it. Nevertheless, Leo was already very nervous, and it was becoming noticeable to everyone around him. To begin with, the notary described the last will of the deceased regarding her godfather, Justino Ferrer, for quite a long time. Everything mentioned in the will concerned his role in the company and the obligation for any successor to keep him in a leadership position until he decided to leave on his own. Understandable and fair, in general. Only this part was written by Anastasia on three sheets, and the old man read it tediously, insistently, and, as a result, very slowly. Leo's impatience was multiplied by the tortoise-like pace of the notary. Finally, the climax of the text reached Leo's ears. The old man read, To my lawful spouse, Leo Crespo, the right to receive the inheritance. After reading this modest and concise note, the reader looked attentively at Leo, as if asking if he understood the essence of what was said. The humiliated husband had nothing left but to nod. He had already mentally prepared himself and decided on this reaction, which he would express publicly. Petra took his hand and tried to stand up to leave demonstratively, but Leo held her in place. She looked at him with a questioning gaze, but the man ignored it. He would also like to leave the place of his public humiliation as soon as possible. Still, the performance was not over yet, and the invited spectator wanted to see it through to the end. After a pause, the notary continued, All my property at the time of my death, whatever it may consist of and wherever it may be located, I bequeath to my only son, Roberto Dies. Until he reaches adulthood, I appoint his father, Alejandro Dies, and Justino Ferrer as guardians and administrators of his father's property. All necessary documents are attached to the text of the will. It was a low blow. It seemed that it hurt Leo, not morally, but physically. What? A son? From Alejandro? His patience snapped, and an astonished cry burst out. This news surprised no one but Leo and Petra. That was natural if one was the father and the other signed documents agreeing to be the guardian of a minor. Leo suspected that his wife would throw something, but where did she get this child? With confidence, he could say that she was not pregnant. The child seemed to be no more than a year old. He might have been irresponsible as a husband, but he would have definitely noticed a pregnant belly. Is this Alejandro's biological child? He asked loudly and randomly. By that time, the notary had already moved far from announcing the main heir and had long started explaining procedural details. The loud shout immediately interrupted the old man, and everyone present, without taking their eyes off, looked at Anastasia's husband. Yes, Roberto is the biological son of Anastasia and Alejandro, Justino said. She wasn't pregnant in the last two years. It wasn't possible. Leo desperately clung to a straw, though he himself understood that, with current technologies, it was entirely unnecessary. The possibilities of medicine nowadays are simply amazing, the godfather smirked. It was evident that Leo's shock and disappointment were deeply satisfying to him. We didn't engage in intimacy with Anastasia, Alejandro's remark was entirely unnecessary and disrupted all the malicious joy that the godfather had just expressed. But it was Anastasia who chose Alejandro as the father of the child because he was incredibly well-mannered, honest, kind, and just. He couldn't help but set the record straight by commenting that Anastasia had been faithful to her husband and had not violated her vows until the end. I don't care. Leo shouted in rage. He didn't swear as planned because he glanced at the little one, who still curiously looked at people around him and observed their behavior. Alejandro's words deeply wounded him. Despite Anastasia's husband's awful character traits, this comparison still stung. It was extremely unpleasant to realize how much of a scoundrel he was and how much he had hurt his wife if this was her revenge. 
Leo's outcry plunged all those present into their own thoughts. The man himself reflected on his life and his behavior. His companion desperately picked up the pieces together, thinking that she wouldn't be the wife of a wealthy widower. The notary, accustomed to such dramatic collisions, thought only of himself. Justino and Alejandro, on the other hand, were immersed in their memories of the day that brought them to this room. The young man remembered with horror the news he received two years ago that his best friend was sick and that the doctors practically gave her no chance of recovery. It was also shocking for him how calmly the young woman reasoned about how much time she had left and what she had to accomplish. At that time, she told her best friend that she wanted to become a mother, despite everything. Can you handle it? Alejandro asked naively. Of course, not on my own. But I arranged to have my ovum taken before starting treatment. I was immediately warned that there was a high probability that I wouldn't have to raise my own child. But I insisted, Alejandro. I grew up without a mother myself. It's not easy, I know. But I always felt her love. I felt that she was close and loved me very much, protecting me. Is Leo willing to raise the child alone? The friend cautiously asked in response. Who would allow him? He would be happy just to become the guardian and spend the child's money. He has no conscience. No, I already understand that my dearest husband, frankly speaking, is a person with questionable human qualities. That's putting it mildly. And his reaction to my diagnosis and prognosis. Oh, I don't even want to discuss it. This person is not worth getting upset over. But what about the child? That's what I wanted to talk to you about, Anastasia hesitated, which was unusual for her. Usually, she wasn't shy at all. I don't know how to discuss this tactfully and delicately. Perhaps there are no such ways. In general, I would like you to be the father of my child, the woman blurted out in a rush. Are you kidding? Alejandro clearly wasn't prepared for such a turn. You have a husband. The man was simply stunned and fell into a stupor. Alejandro was entirely unprepared for this proposal and didn't understand where his best friend, Anastasia, was leading him. Yes, I have a husband, and he will remain so until my death. I've already decided that for sure. Alejandro, in general, didn't understand where she was going with this and remained silent until a specific proposal was made. Alejandro, of course, we won't make it. It's pointless in my current condition. I can't bear the child myself anymore, unfortunately. I asked to retrieve my ovum, and now we need the biological material of the future father. Voila, the doctors will do their magic, and there will be a child. Of course, a woman is needed to carry and give birth to him, but such services are now also available. Can you tell me a bit more about this magic thing? The man tried to joke to lighten the mood. I'm serious with you. Anastasia immediately protested. At first, it seemed absurd, the rantings of a desperate woman. However, in her mind, there was an entire, quite logical plan, which she eagerly shared. It turned out that she had done a tremendous amount of preliminary work by the time of the conversation. She learned everything about the legal aspects, arranged services with a reproductive clinic, and even pre-selected a surrogate mother for the future child. Alejandro, understand that I would have used the donor services, but I need a father for the child. It's no secret to me that I won't be able to see the baby's birth, but I really want to leave something behind, a piece of me. It's worth considering who this child will be left with. I thought long and hard, but besides you, I have no one else to rely on. And I am sure, having known you for so many years, that you will be a wonderful father. I understand that the fate of a single father is not enviable, but I don't know how to formulate it without pressuring you. All I want to say might corner you, and I don't want that. Perhaps you want to create a family, get married, and have children naturally, it's logical. But please, think about it, don't answer me right now. For me, after Leo broke up my heart, it's crucial for me to know that money means nothing to the father of my child and that everything I have goes to him as I got it from my father, so that it won't be plundered and appropriated by unscrupulous people. 
Now I'm not as foolish as I was before Leo's marriage. He taught me a lot, and now I have colossal life experience. Thanks again to Justino for making me insist on a prenuptial agreement. Otherwise, it's hard to imagine what it would be like now. But, thanks to my godfather, all the money is mine, and Leo has no access to them and won't have. I'm sorry, it was another argument for why I chose you. You don't need money at all, you have plenty of it. My father, the man interjected for the first time, adjusting Anastasia's reasoning. You know they will end up with you. You work day and night to make the family business thrive. Yes, you never needed anything. Now I know for sure that a person who is well-fed doesn't understand hunger. Someone who grew up in poverty will never think about a piece of bread, especially if upbringing and decency are also struggles, there will be trouble, and that's why I left, the woman added sadly. Honestly, I'm absolutely confused. I envisioned the process of becoming a father differently, Anastasia. And indeed, I never wanted to apply the status of a single father to myself. I guess all that was said today should remain a secret? Absolutely correct. I have to ask for your permission to consult with my parents. Anastasia protested with gestures, but Alejandro didn't give her a chance to express her outrage aloud. Anastasia, you've known my parents since childhood. They will get to know about it. Understand me, I can't make such a decision alone. I can't and don't want to take on such responsibility. It's a child, a baby. It won't be enough to just have a nanny if you're not there. I'll need the help of close people. You don't have them. Let's discard that option right away. But I have them. I need to inform them and ask for their opinion. Anastasia gave in. There was nothing substantial to object to. She only begged him to swear that the information wouldn't go any further. Alejandro could promise that. The conversation with the parents was very challenging. Dad neutrally accepted everything said, stating that he would support any decision and support his son. Naturally, he would help his grandson or granddaughter as much as he could. Mom wasn't as liberal. Like all mothers, she wanted a normal and happy family for her son. For him to marry a good girl and have children together. She felt endlessly sorry for Anastasia. She had known her from childhood in the best light. But it was very difficult for the mother to come to terms with this request. She couldn't reconcile herself to the fact that her potential grandson's mother was dying and that a stranger would carry and give birth to the child. Can't the disease be passed on to the child? The woman was afraid to ask this question. It was terrible and awkward. Out of place, but how else? This was her grandson. She had to know for sure that nothing threatened him. Overcoming her nature, she asked what Alejandro's father was too embarrassed to ask. She almost immediately said that she didn't have an inherited form of the disease and the biological material was thoroughly examined. This calmed the anxious mother a little, but not completely. Everything was not going as she would have liked. It was not typical at all. Such uncertainty was very frightening. Nevertheless, after thinking it over, she supported her son and said she would accept absolutely any decision Alejandro would make. And of course, she would dote on the child and help in every way she could. It would be her grandson. There couldn't be any other way. Alejandro himself hesitated for a long time. Who could easily make such a decision? Anastasia's proposal shocked him. After much internal turmoil, he decided that there was no point in refusing. After all, what could one regret about the birth of their own child? When he announced his agreement to Anastasia, she was simply overjoyed. The following week, they began the phased implementation of her plan. While Alejandro was sitting and recalling the entire story that had radically changed his life, Justino remembered the conversation that Anastasia started just over two months ago. The godfather came to visit her in the hospital, as usual, and at first, nothing foreshadowed anything unusual. Quite unexpectedly, his goddaughter took the bull by the horns and said that she needed to have a serious conversation with him. They had to discuss something important. Starting from a distance, she said that she considered Justino a second father and hoped he wouldn't refuse her. The man was silently listening to where she was leading. Anastasia, it seemed, had been preparing for the conversation for a long time, 
contemplating how to conduct it. But at the last moment, emotions took over, and, making a melodramatic pause, Anastasia blurted out that she wanted him to formalize the documents to become the guardian of her son. At first, the man thought his goddaughter was delusional. What the hell? Did she have a son? Reading something that reflected internal mistrust and doubts about her sanity, the young woman began to explain in a confused manner. Hearing the story in full, the godfather was in shock. Not only did Anastasia and Alejandro decide on such a desperate step, but they also kept it a secret for so long. How old is Roberto now? Four days ago, he turned eight months, the goddaughter smiled. Can I meet him? Of course. Why are you asking? Anastasia called Alejandro and asked him to bring their son. Two hours later, the four of them were sitting in the hospital room, silent, everyone was looking at the baby. You guys know how to surprise, the man couldn't come to his senses from the shock. While Alejandro and Roberto were on their way to the hospital, Justino had a thorough conversation with Anastasia. That's when she revealed all her cards and all her plans for the future. She only stayed married to Leo for the purpose of teaching him a lesson. It would have been easier to get a divorce. According to the law, there is a presumption of paternity. If I am married to Leo, they should have automatically listed him as the father of my son. Everyone told us there were no options and that later we would have to dispute paternity through the court. Fortunately, Alejandro's father took care of it and found some cool lawyers who put everything in order. The situation is atypical. We had all the medical documents confirming paternity, so they agreed to cooperate. Going to court would have messed up all the plans. I don't want Leo to find out about the child until after my death. In general, he will find out everything when the notary will read the will. We've already decided how it will be drafted and what will be there. We've included all the documents, and I've signed everything. But one aspect remains unaddressed. Roberto will have only one parent soon. It will happen any day now, so Alejandro will be his only parent. Now I've reconsidered a lot in life and don't want to rely on luck. Alejandro has parents, and if something happens to him, Roberto will be with them. But I want you to have rights too, just in case. Including, I have to think about the business and the condition how Roberto will inherit everything. For the solitary Justino, life revolved around nothing but work and Anastasia. He took her illness very hard. There were no doubts, he agreed to everything the young woman asked. She was closer and dearer to him than anyone else. And after the death of his friend, her father, even more so. The only thing he worried about was anticipating provocations from Leo. Understanding people quite well, he felt that confronting him at this moment was not the right approach. It would be better to confront him later, even though he deserved such treatment, no one denied that. Anastasia, are you sure it's wise to deal with your husband this way? He's a despicable person, why involve yourself with him? Why seek revenge from beyond the grave? He said, immediately stopping himself. You understand what I mean. I apologize if... Stop it, I've been thinking about this for two years already. I saw Roberto being born, saw how Alejandro loves him, and saw how his parents love the little one. I don't need anything more, I've come to terms with it, don't worry. Speak your mind. Right now, I'm more irritated by those who talk to me about some mystical recovery and healing. As for Leo, I loved him so much and believed in him. And he's just the most ungrateful scum. He comes to the hospital as if it's a prison, and his mistresses bring him here. Did you know that? The man nodded silently with bitterness. Everyone around whispered about it. Leo had long ceased to make a secret of his affairs. And should I forgive him and forget about it? No way. He loves money the most, and that's how I'll punish him. Let him build his castles in the air. He won't know about the will and Roberto until the end. It will be a surprise for him. You see, I've hidden everything from you. It was very difficult. I wanted to introduce you to my son right away, but I was very cautious so that no one accidentally found out and told Leo. Let this be our farewell. I wrote him a letter. The notary will read it. Justino sat and pondered that conversation with Anastasia. 
It took place almost two months ago, and since then, he has tried to dissuade her several times. It seemed like a very bad idea. But she stood her ground, and he had to give in. After all, it was her last will, and he needed to trade it with respect. During the sudden silence that fell in the notary's office, everyone was lost in their thoughts. And Leo, more precisely, Anastasia's mother, cursed her on every possible occasion. People like him could never understand that the fault might have been with themselves. The behavior of other people could be a completely logical response, but it was too complicated. Why look for a problem within oneself? Leo was standing there, looming over the table, in the prolonged pause. Strangely enough, Petra broke the silence. She tried to pull her lover by the elbow to lead him out, but he wasn't going to leave. He hadn't finished, he hadn't said everything. He was only interested in money, and he saw no point in hiding it. Addressing the notary, he asked a question. Won't I get anything? Mandatory share, or whatever it's called. I'm her husband. The man whined, shaking his rights. Even Petra winced, he was behaving this way, not to mention the others. Only the old notary, for whom such behavior was familiar and expected, was not surprised at all. According to the article that names the individuals entitled to a mandatory share later on, you are not included. Moreover, I carefully studied your marital contract. Its text is attached here. The old man clapped his chubby hands on the thick folder in front of him. You have no chance in court. Although the right to appeal remains with you, of course. If you disagree, you can try to contest the will. Of course, I will contest. It's not even clear who this brat she listed as her son is really from. Leo said it without thinking. Alejandro barely restrained himself from standing up and confronting the arrogant husband of Anastasia. Even the usually calm and composed Justino suddenly blushed with anger. The notary remained as cool as a cucumber. Nothing surprised him. Everything was within the framework of a normal working day. He calmly responded, here are not only the child's birth certificate, but also medical documents that provide exhaustive answers to questions about his birth. Furthermore, in terms of inheritance, at the request of the deceased, the results of a DNA test are included. The research confirms that your wife is Roberto Diza's biological mother. I can warn you right away that the entire set of documents is fully prepared for all eventualities. Can I see it? Leo wanted to see it with his own eyes. No, you can only familiarize yourself with the part that concerns you personally. All other documents, especially those related to a child, can only be disclosed with the consent of his parent. I do not give permission, of course. Alejandro instantly raised his voice. Then, Leo, only in the case of a legal dispute, if the court deems it necessary to request these documents... This finally crushed Leo. He stormed out of the office, slamming the door loudly behind him, shouting that he wouldn't let it go like this. His companion turned out to be more composed and well-mannered. She said her goodbyes and left, calmly closing the door behind her. Is it okay that this fool didn't sign what they read to him in the text of the will? Justino asked the notary. There's a lot of people like him. There is nothing to worry about. It's just a formality, reassured the old man. Can we go? Roberto wanted to go to the circus and see the animals. Now, I think he's had enough. It would be funny if it weren't so sad. How could Anastasia get involved with him? The godfather was puzzled by what he had seen, and the question was rhetorical. The men signed the necessary documents were required, shook hands, and went their separate ways. Justino helped Alejandro take little Roberto and descend with the stroller. Will you come with us? I want to take a short walk and get some fresh air. The little one needs it too. Of course, I'll join. For a while, they walked side by side in silence, listening to the rustle of the stroller wheels carrying the peacefully sleeping baby. Do you think Anastasia would be pleased with how I'm handling things? Alejandro finally asked the question that was bothering him. I'm sure she would be, you're an excellent dad. It's evident that you and him are single whole. The godfather encouraged him. 
Honestly, something else is on my mind. You know, I think Anastasia shared this with you. I tried to dissuade her from what just happened. You mean this joke with the will and how he found out about Roberto? Justino remained silent and simply nodded. Of course she talked about it, Alejandro replied. I constantly brought up this topic myself. I didn't like this idea from the very beginning. He's an unpleasant guy, bitter, and mercenary. Why provoke him? Honestly, I even had the impulse to tell him when the baby was born. But Anastasia kept it so secret. I thought I didn't have the right to do that. So I convinced myself that she just didn't want to deal with him personally and left these disputes to us. And today, I saw him with that tramp, he didn't hesitate. Now I'm not sure if it was the right thing to do. His reaction and his expression were like a tortoise walking. Awful. I should have gotten rid of him earlier. Especially since I read the marriage contract, we could have gotten rid of him in a second. And now, I have to go and, literally, as the heir's representative, seize all the valuables, the car, and evict him from the apartment. I don't want to see him. I think Anastasia didn't want to either. That also played a role. She wanted to get revenge because she loved him, so he wouldn't say anything later. She loved him so much, and this damned love found no other way out, my poor girl. The man wiped away a tear. Don't be sad about her, she asked you not to. She just wanted all the love we had for her to be directed towards Roberto, Alejandro comforted the godfather, patting him on the back. While the men were speaking about their concerns and indulging in memories, Leo and Petro were observing them from the car and discussing the same topic. So, you really won't get anything at all? The girl asked, disbelievingly blinking her eyelashes. What a fool you are. I said it, no chances at all because of this brat. Okay, let's go. We need to at least pick up something valuable and manage to move it to my apartment. Three days later, when Alejandro finally mustered the courage to go to Anastasia's house, no one was there. He had prepared for a tough confrontation, even bringing his security personnel along to avoid unnecessary trouble. However, Leo understood everything correctly and had already moved out. Of course, not without his own benefit. He took from the house numerous valuable items that could be considered personal. In other words, Alejandro tried to maintain some legality regarding Anastasia's belongings. Leo was sitting in his tiny kitchen in the apartment he inherited from his parents, sipping on bitterness. Petra had left him. Why would she want to date a penniless guy? Leo pondered how he had come to this point. In the past, he used to be paid, and now a young and beautiful girl took money to be with him. Of course, the not-so-young and degraded playboy blamed everyone but himself for his misfortunes. In his version of events, his ex-wife was to blame for everything that happened. She drained him of all his life force and, in the end, tipped him over with the inheritance. He had hoped for the money to instantly transform into a successful businessman with a heap of assets. Coping with such a loss was not easy. As Anastasia rightly told Alejandro, Leo was building castles in the air. Indeed, he had built them. In his fantasies, he was young, handsome, successful, and very wealthy. Because of her, he lost everything. As it turned out, he wasn't as young and attractive as before, as Petra vividly demonstrated when she left. Upon her farewell, she said many pleasant things. He was unwanted, a penniless drunkard who thought he was a land Delon. After her departure, Leo was horrified to realize that this was true. Everything she said wasn't out of spite or to offend. His former lover simply told the truth because pretending was utterly meaningless. Added to the blame on his ex-wife was the fact that he couldn't be successful and wealthy now. The chance to become a successful businessman collapsed like a house of cards. Leo spent almost two weeks of his life on a continuous binge. He wanted to escape from reality. The shattered crystal dream cut him into small pieces. Coming to terms with this pain was extremely difficult. As a typical infantile egotist, he didn't see his fault in what happened. The root of all troubles and the embodiment of all demonic creatures was his deceased wife. 
When he married her, he was the dream of any well-off lady, but he turned into a bum because of his wife. He constantly wound himself up and convinced himself that all the blame was on Anastasia. Naturally, with each passing day, the intensity of hatred increased. In one of the morning hangover fits, Leo finally decided that enough was enough. This method wouldn't bring him success, and he wouldn't even get revenge on his ex-wife. As it seemed to him, she would only be happy and amused to see him dragged into the abyss of alcohol dependence. The man finally resolved to pull himself together, not drink for a few days, and then visit a legal consultation in a somewhat decent state. Suddenly, a glimmer of hope appeared before him, showing that not everything was lost. Maybe there was some chance to get at least a small share of the inheritance. Previously, he had hoped for the entire fortune, but now he would be happy with a modest handout. Leo felt deeply humiliated when, a few days ago, people from Justino arrived at his place. They almost forcibly took away the car keys and tore up the power of attorney issued by Anastasia. One of the guys declared, Didn't you know that a power of attorney loses its legal force after the death of the person who issued it? Leo felt spat on and morally destroyed. Someone gave him a backhander to make him speak about where he had hidden Anastasia's jewelry. At that moment, he certainly didn't feel any guilt. He didn't think for a second that he had done something wrong. In essence, by stealing his wife's jewelry from the house, he thought it was rightfully his and that he had the right to have at least something. After all, he endured his wife for almost three years. He believed he was entitled to some compensation. In his own eyes, Leo painted his own portrait as an almost saintly figure who never left the bedside of his sick wife. In such moments, he forgot about endless intrigues, gambling addiction, alcohol, and his neglectful attitude towards his wife. This is a very convenient quality for such irresponsible egotists who only love themselves and create a flawless self-portrait in their minds. Leo had convinced himself of his infallibility and perfection for so long that he believed it and was ready to prove it with foam at his mouth. With all these thoughts about glaring injustice and his own fairness and impeccability, he went through the detoxification period. As it turned out, he already had a craving for alcohol, which unpleasantly surprised Leo. He desperately wanted to drink, but he held on to the idea he repeatedly convinced himself of how good he was and how unjustly he was treated. He should have stood up and fought for himself, defending his rights and legitimate interests. With this message that he needed help and sympathy, he decided to get a consultation. The kind young woman nodded sympathetically, seemingly entirely on his side. However, when it came to giving advice to the client, she firmly stated that there were no options. Understand, you signed this prenuptial agreement yourself. It was drafted exceptionally professionally and meticulously. You cannot claim any property in the marriage. This is if we are talking about allocating some share of the inheritance, which would be due to you under the marital regime of joint property ownership. But there is nothing to allocate here. There was no such regime. It was excluded by this prenuptial agreement. What about the inheritance? The notary at the will reading told me that I'm not among the heirs entitled to, let's say, a mandatory share. It's true for the heirs entitled to a mandatory share of the inheritance. The law clearly names the list of such individuals. It is closed, and you indeed do not fall into it. Could my wife really write a will, excluding me from it? Yes, of course. And you could have done the same. A will is intended to change the common order prescribed by law. It's exactly the same as with the prenuptial agreement. By signing it, you change the legal regime of joint property ownership prescribed by law. A will changes the order of inheritance prescribed by law. If there were no will, you would inherit alongside her son. She changed this order with her final will. Can I contest this? You can always try, but there are no chances. I'm telling you this honestly and openly. There are no grounds to declare the will invalid. And what about the prenuptial agreement? Leo ventured to clarify with hope in his voice. The same thing. There are no hidden conditions, only standard formulations of business people trying to preserve their capital. 
If you want to know my professional opinion, I wouldn't waste nerves and money on futile lawsuits. I see, the last hopes were crumbling before his eyes. Let me clarify one thing. You said that if there were no will, we would inherit everything equally with her son, right? Yes, if there is no will, inheritance occurs according to the law. In this case, heirs are called in order. First, the first order, and if they're not there, the second, and so on. In this specific case, your wife had no parents. There are you, the spouse, and one child. So, the two of you would have divided the entire inheritance between yourselves, the girl patiently explained the nuances. Because each order of inheritance clearly names an exhaustive list of individuals. For the first order, it includes parents, children, and the spouse of the deceased. What happens if the heir named in the will dies? It depends on whether they die before or after the will is opened, that is, after the death of the testator. Is that significant? Extremely crucial. If the heir named in the will dies before the will is opened and there is no indication of an alternate heir, the will is nullified and everything goes according to the law. If they die after it's opened, there's something called testamentary transmission. In essence, if the heir named in the will dies after the testator's death, the heirs of this second deceased person inherit. I'm confused, it seems. Can you explain it in simpler terms? In rough terms, and as applied to your case, if your late wife's son were to die right now, all your wife's property would be inherited by his legal father as his only heir of the first order. How is that possible? Leo yelled, he had entered a state of blind rage. That's what the law provides for. The legal consultant recoiled from the table, hearing such a reaction to the dry statement of facts. Is that 100% true? If you don't trust me, I can call colleagues or show you the document. No, there's no need for that. The rage turned into a bitter feeling of despair. After paying at the counter, he stormed out, slamming the door loudly. Can't these damn lawyers talk in plain language? Explain things properly. Leo fumed to himself. And again, he couldn't find the strength to accept the situation and come to terms with it. No, he saw culprits. This time, the culprit was the girl who simply told him about his chances. Well, of course, in Leo's mind, the main monster that ruined his entire life was Anastasia. She was to blame for everything. Why did she give birth to this damn child? He fumed. And if she needed him that much, I should have been the father. Vile woman. He was unaware of the reasons why she acted this way and why she wanted someone else, not her husband, to be the father of her child. His current behavior vividly and colorfully illustrated why Anastasia reasoned correctly. Leo's anger crushed him from the inside out. It manifested outwardly and returned to him, burning everything in its path. He walked to the bus, contemplating why he had to sink so low because of his wife. She and only she were to blame for everything. He wanted revenge. How sad that she died, and I can't hit her, he thought. So many times I barely held back my impulse, reassuring myself that my patience would be generously rewarded. He began to contemplate how he would exact revenge on her and what he could do now. A sick person who had pushed himself to the extreme and didn't realize it. His thoughts leaped to the point where he wanted to go and desecrate her grave. He pondered what was dear to her and what would cause her the greatest suffering. The answer was obvious, and he saw it, the petty degenerate, Roberto. Leo recoiled as if struck by a shock. He walked and smiled because, finally, he had come up with his plan for revenge. Of course, there were still many questions to resolve and details to structure, but the main thing was that he had decided. No, he wasn't going to hurt him. Worse, much worse. What's a mother's worst nightmare? Being unable to help her child in distress. That's precisely what he decided to do. The plan was simple and ingenious for his inflamed imagination. Kidnap the child, take him to a neighboring city, and drop him off at an orphanage in a week so that the facts couldn't be precisely connected. Of course, the boy was no longer a newborn, but still too small. He wasn't even a year old. So, he wouldn't remember anything and would be helpless, which was exactly what Leo needed. 
Thoughts and revenge fantasies warmed his soul, if he had one, of course. He hadn't smiled like this in a long time. From the outside, such a grimace looked intimidating and frightening. But Anastasia's husband didn't care at all. One could even say he was happy. As he thought through all the details, he experienced euphoria. There was no object of hatred nearby, and he couldn't harm Anastasia in any way. But her husband knew her well enough to imagine how she would suffer from her child's misfortune and her inability to help him. The awareness and visualization of his wife's suffering brought him colossal satisfaction. When the man's theoretical plan settled in his mind, he started thinking about the practical side of things. It was necessary to find out everything about Roberto's movements and who he associated with outside the house to perfectly time and kidnap the child. Leo had known Alejandro quite well in his past life and was even acquainted with his parents, having visited their home. Now he didn't need to explain where exactly the father and son lived, in a city apartment or in the family's country mansion. Taking a car-sharing vehicle, Leo went to Alejandro's office to tail him and thus locate the child. The wait wasn't long. Now the man had a new status as a dad and tried not to linger in the office for too long. In extreme cases, he took work with him. He got into the car and drove home, with Leo following at a distance. When Alejandro's car left the city center, it was already clear that they were heading to the country cottage. This complicates the plan a bit, Leo said, slightly disappointed. In an elite suburban settlement, there was enhanced security, both within the entire settlement and personally in each house. Leo knew this for sure. When he confirmed that Alejandro was definitely turning towards the parents' settlement and there was nowhere else to go, Leo drove past. He didn't turn after him, he didn't want to attract unnecessary attention. Only at that moment did Leo finally realize the difficulties he would face in realizing his plan. It was unknown how much time he would have to spend literally in the woods with binoculars to study the daily routine and movements of the child. It was worth weighing everything again, whether the game was worth the candle. Absolutely sure. Leo reasoned with himself, whose psyche noticeably wavered after the revelation of the will. That bitch ruined my life, and I'll ruin her bastard's life. Rich air. The man laughed maliciously. He'll live off the state's generosity, and his mommy will watch from above, understanding that it's all her fault. If Leo had encountered someone compassionate at that moment, someone who noticed the changes happening to him and led him to a doctor, the story might have taken a different turn. But history doesn't entertain subjunctive moods. In the end, people get what they strive for. As the saying goes, beware of your desires, they have a tendency to come true. Leo so desperately wanted his wife's death and believed that it would bring him satisfaction. He believed it would make him lonely and rich. Wishes don't always come true, as we imagine. Everything that happened could have served as an important life lesson for him, but Leo disliked lessons, and they brought him no benefit. Since childhood, he has simply assigned blame without trying to understand the situation or find the cause within himself. But Leo had no equals in achieving goals. Once he fixed something in his mind, no matter how foolish it might be in the process, he saw it through to the end. Unfortunately, this case was no happy exception. He spent a whole two days not observing but preparing all the necessary conditions for surveillance. Leo circled the entire area to find the perfect vantage point. He needed a place where he could observe the entire settlement. And, most importantly, the house of Alejandro dies. It was also essential that the observer himself remain unseen. His hideout had to be discreet enough. Leo spared no effort or time until he found a place he deemed perfect in every way. For over a week, Leo woke up before dawn and rushed to the cottage settlement, staying there until late in the evening. He diligently observed everything happening in the house using binoculars, keeping meticulous notes not to miss anything. It turned out that the child was taken care of by his father, grandmother, and nanny. They were the main people he associated with outside the house. Alejandro and his mother were entirely unsuitable for Leo's planned action. Both of them knew Anastasia's husband by sight and could immediately point him out. 
Leo's plans absolutely did not include taking the blame for the crime. Of course, he assumed that there would be questions, but he hoped to brush them off. After all, this child was the heir of two major companies. Hasn't anyone heard of kidnapping for ransom? In this regard, the nanny was chosen as the victim of the attack. She came and went at a strictly defined time, walking with Roberto along the same routes, which pleased Leo. Moreover, the stars aligned specifically for him. On Wednesday, during their daytime walk with the peacefully sleeping child in the stroller, the woman went beyond the guarded territory of the settlement. Along a small forest path, she reached a small clearing where another nanny from a nearby similar settlement was evidently waiting for her. They'd been chatting and walking with their strollers, and Leo could even hear their laughter. For the plan to work, it had to be reliable. He had to wait for some time and prepare. He understood this perfectly, so he decided to observe the nanny for several more Wednesdays to determine if this was the norm or, more likely, an exception. The situation was delicate and required great precision and certainty. Leo temporarily stopped patrolling the settlement every single day. This would only attract someone's attention. He needed to remain unnoticed. Now he only came on Wednesdays, precisely when the nanny went out for her daytime walk. And everything was as precise as clockwork. Every Wednesday, she exited and took a forest path beyond the reach of the security around the cottage settlement. It was just an unheard of stroke of incredible luck for the kidnapper. He visited for four consecutive Wednesdays to make sure that the system didn't glitch. On the fourth time, when he saw the nanny going beyond the settlement, he left, knowing he would return the next Wednesday at the same time. But this time, he would leave with the child. Leo carefully calculated the nanny's entire route, identifying the most convenient place to attack her. To carry out the attack, he acquired a powerful stun gun, bought it at the local market, and paid with cash to make it untraceable. He meticulously planned every detail to execute his plan and avoid getting caught. In the same manner, he acquired an old domestic car through a power of attorney, naturally stole license plates, and affixed them to the purchased vehicle. He calculated where to leave the car so he would have to run close enough, but not so close that it would catch someone's eye. The man also devised his appearance to conceal his figure and face, making him unrecognizable. Thoughts of the kidnapping became an obsession. He fell asleep with them and woke up, thinking about the same thing again. Moreover, he began to dream of how he would kidnap Roberto, down to the tiniest details. By the appointed day, he had lost almost 7 kilograms, becoming a shadow of himself. Even a fleeting glance at Leo immediately signaled that this person should have been afraid of him. On Wednesdays, he parked in a pre-selected spot and waited. Minutes felt like hours, and Leo arrived two hours earlier than usual when the woman went for a walk with the child. This time seemed like an eternity to him. Such prolonged waiting drove a person who was already in an unstable emotional state out of his mind. Thirty minutes before the usual time, he moved onto the street. The observation point and the attack site were chosen in advance, just like the kidnapping location. When Leo saw the nanny walking down the path, pushing a stroller in front of her, his heart sank. The long plan completely disconnected him from the understanding that he would have to do this for real. Approaching an unknown woman, pushing her, and hitting her with a stun gun would be a serious task. Then he would have to take the child out of the stroller and run to the car. In his mind, it was as if it would happen differently, like in a computer game. But this was all too real. There she was, that woman. There was the stroller, with the curious child inside, examining the world around him. By nature, Leo was not inclined to violence, and crossing this line was quite challenging. However, he remembered why he had planned all of this. He recalled that raging hatred for Anastasia and rushed out of his hiding place. The first part of the plan was executed flawlessly, much like the organization, which was beyond praise. However, fate intervened. Leo rushed to the nanny of the child, effortlessly pushed her away from the stroller, knocked her to the ground, and pressed the button on the stun gun, delivering a powerful electric shock to her ribs. She bent sharply. All that remained was the child. Leo needed to extract him from the stroller and run to the car. 
However, things went awry at this stage. Leo had to crouch in front of the stroller to unbuckle the safety straps holding the child. Suddenly, the kidnapper heard a loud sound and felt a burning pain in his right side. He collapsed on the ground in a fetal position. Roberto, frightened by the noises and the rapidly changing scenery, started crying loudly. The next moment, Leo lost consciousness. He only came to his senses slightly when an elderly man in the attire of a rural huntsman was standing over him, exhaling a strong smell of alcohol. The man, without mincing words, berated the wounded Leo and tied his hands. At that moment, the kidnapper lost consciousness again. The unfamiliar man was the man whom Anastasia's husband had called a huntsman. Marco was well known in two adjacent elite settlements. His guard post was practically in the middle, a bit further from the clearing where nannies from neighboring settlements met. The huntsman dwelling was well hidden by dense vegetation, and Leo simply didn't notice it. As it turned out, on that day, Marco was returning from a local shop where he had just purchased a pick-me-up for his hangover. He always carried his double-barreled shotgun with him, a long-standing habit. As he later candidly explained to the police, having a gun slung over his shoulder made it look like he was on business, not just loitering around, it was convenient. That's how he saw suspicious activity on his way back from the shop. I see some guy on watch. All in black, and the temperature has been plus 30 degrees since morning. I thought I should have seen what this rascal was up to. Years of habit and the skill of a hunter allowed Marco to move through the forest absolutely silently, not to scare away game. Moreover, he knew this area better than the back of his hand. Well, here I was, settled behind that little tree, he said, providing explanations. I was standing, observing. Enjoying nature while being vigilant at the same time. Listen, he interrupted himself, addressing the police officer who was writing the protocol, I won't get in trouble for this, will I? I didn't really knock him out cold, did I? No, doctor said he'd survive. And you might even get a medal and a cash reward from the relatives. The man was so delighted that the crime had been thwarted and he wouldn't end up in the police precinct that he forgave the man even a familiarity bordering on insult. He could see the guy speaking without any ill intentions. And the woman. How she jerked away from his stun gun. I was even startled. Everything's fine with her now. Don't worry. Okay, don't get distracted. What happened next? And then I see this scoundrel suddenly darting towards the woman, knocking her down, and trying to reach the child. Well, I took a shot at him. Nice. Yeah, the distance was tiny. I was sure I'd hit the winch in the side, otherwise, I wouldn't have taken the shot. The kid in the stroller was right there, about 40 centimeters in front of him. Exactly. You did well, Marco. You'll be a local celebrity now. Look, journalists are already gathering over there, eager to interview you. Come on, sign the paper, and off you go. Bask in the rays of glory. No, I won't go. Can't I just skip it? Why not? I don't want to. Can I go home? Well, of course. If anything, know that we'll definitely be calling you again. Come right away when you get the call, agreed? Fine. Marco calmly walked back to his place through the backways so no one would follow him. He felt like he hadn't done anything special. Anyone in his place would have done the same. How can you not help when someone is mistreating those who can't defend themselves? It's all about upbringing, which, apparently, would not never go away. A few hours later, closer to the evening, someone politely knocked on the door of Marco's guard post. Come in. The owner shouted, getting up from his stool. The door opened, and a young man entered. Hello. Are you Marco? I am. What do you want? I'm the father of the boy you saved today. He's a good boy. I took him in my arms, and he calmed down right away, brave little guy. And a smart look in his eyes. Thank you so much. What a stroke of luck that you happened to be there at that exact time. Thank you for not walking by, Alejandro was ready to cry from an overflow of emotions. 
The day had been too intense, greatly shaking the young man. Tell me, how could I repay you? Oh, come on. There's really nothing to be thankful for. What are you talking about if a child has been at stake? Marco was genuinely shocked that he was being thanked for such a thing. Nevertheless, Alejandro insisted. Well, if it's so important to you, you can buy me some butter and some cigarettes. That's never too much. Of course. Hey, if you don't mind me asking, that cop never spilled the beans to me. Did you want to kidnap for money, didn't he? Like, was he planning to ask for a ransom? Oh, unfortunately, it's much more complicated than that. Well, tell me if you can. I've been living here in an information vacuum, so to speak, and it's getting boring. It'll take a long time, doesn't it bother you? Not at all, my friend. I'll put the kettle on with perfect timing. Sit down and start. Alejandro hesitantly began recounting everything that had happened to him over the past year, Anastasia, her illness, the crazy idea of becoming parents, her death, and her final act of revenge on her husband. After they had coffee, he continued telling Marco everything he learned from the police. As it turned out, Leo was straightforward about his plans. Perhaps he realized that resisting was futile and that it was better to tell everything himself. Leo was deeply offended by the thought that they believed he did all this for money. He was driven by revenge. Alejandro was actually very glad that Marco asked and even insisted on the story. He himself wanted to talk to someone about it to share. Of course, his parents found out about what happened before him and knew the whole story. He called and told Justino everything, but it wasn't the same. They were biased and would never say what they really thought, always siding with Anastasia and Alejandro. But Alejandro himself wanted an unbiased opinion. He pondered that they had treated Leo wrongly. They had provoked him into this disturbance of the mind, this obsession, which pushed him to the desire for revenge. And if it had only concerned him, Alejandro wouldn't have reflected so much. But everything his parents did came back to their little ones. That was the fundamental difference between Leo and Alejandro. One never took the blame for what happened unto himself to avoid it happening again. The other, on the contrary, rushed to reconsider his behavior. Didn't he cause what happened? In the end, he couldn't help it and, after finishing the story, asked Marco, as an impartial observer, as an uninterested party. Do you think we drove him to this? Are we to blame for him so desperately wanting to retaliate against us? Seriously, dude? You're a grown-up, but you're talking such nonsense. Leo would find a reason anyway. Yes, he didn't really need one. Just think about it. You got married for green papers, cheated like the last tramp, acted like a scoundrel with a sick wife, and convinced yourself that she was to blame for everything. What's she to blame for, anyway? That she once answered back, couldn't stand it, and didn't take it as granted? She hit where it hurt the most, the wallet. On the contrary, she's a hero. The woman came up with and executed such a plan. This candid truth from a simple man's mouth really lifted Alejandro's spirits. He deeply contemplated each word Marco said. Now I owe you for good advice too. He smiled. In response, the huntsman just waved his hand. They parted ways as friends. Marco promised to drop by, not forgetting about the kid. I heard somewhere that the Chinese have a belief or wisdom, God knows what to call it. Anyway, if you save someone's life, it means you're forever responsible for that person. So don't worry about your Roberto, I'll keep an eye on him here too. The huntsman smiled. And he kept his word, he regularly visited the house and was always a welcome guest. Despite his fondness for excess, he never came in drunk and always refused to sit at the table, going straight to chat and play with Roberto. In him, the boy found another loving family member. Nine months later, the court sentenced Leo and imposed a seven-year prison term. Over this long period, everyone more or less calmed down and returned to their usual peaceful lives. The family could finally breathe a little. Justino regularly visited the boy and doted on him, roughly fulfilling the responsibilities entrusted to him by the godmother. 
Alejandro met a single mom whose daughter went to the same daycare group as Roberto. Their relationship developed very well, and the kids got along. The whole family hoped that this time things would work out well for him in his personal life, and Roberto would have a stepmother and a sister, possibly more than one. But, of course, Alejandro, as promised by Anastasia, would never let Roberto forget his biological mother. He constantly talked about her and showed the boy her photos and videos, always reminding him that mom loved her little boy very much and was always with him. She protected and cherished him, even if he couldn't see her. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.